Normally, he's co-hosting a show on Wednesdays called Music City Roots. I don't know if you guys have any fans of that show. It's fantastic. And he is going to be coming up here, at least when we do this on Thursdays, hopefully on a regular basis. And he's going to be our Who Knew Historian. Uh, he's a journalist and co-host of Music City Roots. He's incredibly intelligent, passionate about Nashville, uh, easy to become friends with. Please give it up for Craig Havoghurst. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. Yeah, take that. Hey, everybody. It's nice to be here. And uh, pray to God that my slides are here, where there's the logos, and there's more logos. And I'm looking for the slides. Here we go. That's my name. All right. And uh, please think of me as the who knew history guy, because to call me a historian is a disservice to hist real historians. I'm a writer. I love history. And I'm thrilled that uh, Tom invited me to uh, talk about some chapters of Nashville's why we're here and how we got here. And couldn't start with a, better, with a topic that was, it was easy to pick the first one. In a town where greatness is recognized by being on a first name basis, i.e. Vince, Garth, Reba, the first two guys who earned first name status in Nashville are the guys I'm talking about tonight. Owen and Chet. Yay, right? Chet Atkins and Owen Bradley are the two most important record producers and executives in Nashville history. They are the architects of Music Row. It is not wise to work in Music City without knowing the story of these great musicians and great men. Uh, this, brothers and sisters, is almost everything you need to know about Chet and Owen in 10 minutes. Owen is born first in 1915. He grows up in the rural outskirts of Nashville. He is 10 years old in 1925 when WSM goes on the air. He has a crystal radio set. He tunes in WSM loud and clear, and it's not a country radio station at the time. Wouldn't be for a long time. He listens to the big band pop music of the Francis Craig Orchestra and the Beasley Smith Orchestra, and the big bands coming in from New York and Chicago like Duke Ellington and, uh, and, and uh, people like Count Basie and Duke Ellington. Owen learns the piano, the trombone, a few other instruments, and he works gigs from his teens on through his entire life. Parties, country clubs, supper clubs, burlesque shows, society music was widespread in Nashville before World War II, and Owen was one of the best young musicians and band leaders in Nashville. Here he is as a young man playing exactly that kind of gig on the vibes, that's him, on the right. If you dressed like that today and played the vibes, you'd get a record deal on Third Man. I guarantee you. Um, Owen lands a coveted job at WSM in 1936. He does everything. He conducts and arranges bands. He backs up, uh, he backs up on the piano pop singers like Dinah Shore. And he's so good at what he does that by 1942, he's named music director at WSM, one of the most prestigious radio stations in the country. This is a little example of one of the uh, shows he would have done. He did yes. do. Noontime, neighbors. Hi, noontime, neighbors. Forget your labors. Everybody's happy. Noontime, neighbors is a farm news show. A farm news show that runs every day, five days a week, with a 20 person orchestra and chorus, and a conductor, Owen Bradley, for part of the time. It runs five days a week for 25 years. That's how radio used to be, folks, and it was awesome. Meanwhile, in East Tennessee, Luttrell, Tennessee, to be exact, trivia moment, same hometown as Kenny Chesney, Chet Atkins is born in, where am I here, 1924. He plays ukulele, fiddle, and finally the guitar at age nine. When he's 15 years old, he hears a guy on the radio named Merle Travis, and his world is flipped upside down, and he decides he's got to pick like Merle Travis. His other key influence early on is Django Reinhardt. In 1942, Chet gets his first good gig at Knoxville's WNOX, where he works with hillbilly artists like future Opry star Jumpin' Bill Carlisle, but it is uh, not steady work, and he travels where the work is, including a gig with Red Foley. That brings him to Nashville for a brief period of time where he gets to be on the Opry stage with Red Foley for the first time. While he's in town, he records his first 
guitar solo record at the WSM new studio, new recording studio. And who's on the session playing keyboards? Owen Bradley. This is when recording was, was born and truly boomed in Nashville, just after World War II. The big record companies came to town, and Owen gets extra side work, assisting on sessions for Decca Records with artists like Ernest Tubb, Red Foley, Kitty Wells, and others. But he keeps going at WSM2, and one day, in 1950, he's, on the, he's about to go on the air in Red Foley's band. He's sitting at the keyboard, and the announcer, David Cobb, says to the NBC national audience, ladies and gentlemen, from Nashville, Tennessee, Music City, USA, Red Foley. This is the first time the phrase Music City, USA has ever been uttered as a, in that way. And that's where the brand begins, 1950 with, on WSM with Owen at the keyboards. Oops, don't want to go too fast. Da, da. But we got to get Chet to town. Owen's doing fine, but Chet needs to get to Nashville full time. And he finally does so in a way that I highly recommend in the entourage of some lovely ladies. <laughs> you are looking at the Carter sisters. Mother Maybelle Carter with the guitar there is the, from the famous Carter family. That guitar is now in the Country Music Hall of Fame's permanent exhibit. The uh, woman on the far left is June Carter, who's going to marry Johnny Cash and become a really big deal later on. And Chet's the guitar player in the band. They need a gig at the Grand Ole Opry Bad. They come for an audition. High pressure. The folks at the Opry say, we love what y'all do, but we don't need the dude with the guitar. Mother Maybell says, Chet is in our band. It's either him and all of us or none of us. And that is how Chet, thanks to Mother Maybell Carter, gets to Music City full time. Bum, bum, bum. Quickly, he makes his mark, and he rises very quick, because he's about the best guitar player that anybody has seen in town. Um, where are we? He plays recording sessions at WSM's Castle Studios. He makes solo records, and he is on the air, uh, backing up vocalists, much the way that, uh, that Owen did. And here's one example. I, you, can, you can hear Chet's solo records on Spotify all day long, but check this out. No, not that. Come on, I gotta. Tell me why you don't Though I try. Chet to on guitar forget. in the background. Tell me why. Why I think of you yet. I know I'll never. This is from a short-lived show called Dream Time. The singer is Dolores Watson, who was, in my opinion, the best pop singer to ever perform at WSM, which is saying something. Trivia moment, she will marry John Siegenthaler, editor of The Tennessean, and they will have uh, be married almost 60 years. Chet also, in 1956, records his first solo hit guitar record, which is his amazing arrangement of Mr. Sandman. Go check it out. It's awesome. Owen moves on to production, kind of steps away from WSM, and takes advantage of the recording boom. And he and his brother Harold Bradley, who is still working today, convert a home on 16th Avenue into a recording studio and add a Quonset hut on the back and build the famous Quonset hut studio in the mid-1950s. This is where Owen produces Patsy Cline doing Crazy and Brenda Lee doing I'm Sorry and so much more. Just one block away, Chet Atkins sets up in the headquarters of RCA Victor, who built a state-of-the-art studio. You've seen Studio B and Studio A. And there he produces Jim Reeves, pictured doing He'll Have to Go, and Don Gibson's Oh, Lonesome Me, and much more. Chet proves himself a stunningly affected A&R man. He discovers the Everly Brothers in the Ryman Alley, playing for nobody, and brings them immediately onto the Ryman stage, and their career begins there. He will go on to sign Dolly Parton, Waylon, Willie, and bravely, Charlie Pride. This is the time, and these are the places where Chet and Owen fuse country and pop music together into the so-called Nashville sound. The body of work saved Nashville's music business in the 50s and 60s, and it was great because it drew from great country music and great pop music and made it work. But Chet is a player, first and foremost, a guitarist. He loves jazz, he plays after hours around town, and he records a lot. Here's an amazing historic album recorded at, or rather near, the Newport Jazz Festival in 1960 with an all Nashville band. Uh, it's called After the Riot, Seek It Out and Get It. There's great stories behind that, I might do it in a future day. 
Here is a sample of the 80 plus albums Chet made as a player in his career. He arranged every kind of music for the guitar. Broadway standards, Beatles, flamenco tunes, folk standards. He played with orchestras. He did duo records with every great guitar player living, from Doc Watson and Jerry Reed to Les Paul and Mark Knopfler. I will say here, without reservation, as a guitar player, Chet Atkins is the greatest guitar player that ever lived. <laughs> Amen. Where Chet backs off from producing to play more, Owen digs deeper and does more. He produces Loretta Lynn, Conway Twitty, and their great duets together. He sells the Quonset Hut, and he builds Bradley's Barn Studio in Mount Juliet, Tennessee. He's, uh, that move happens in the early 60s. That place is busy for decades. In the 1980s, he produces the soundtrack to Coal Miner's Daughter there, as well as Katie Lang's famous Shadowland album, which brought Owen back to public knowledge. When Owen dies in 19... Uh, 98, at the age of 82, he was working with a young singer named Mandy Barnett, and his office, just as it was when he passed, is, has been lovingly recreated at the Country Music Hall of Fame. It's one of my favorite exhibits over there. Chet, meanwhile, lived, played, collaborated, and tinkered with guitars until his death in 2001. Now, not long ago, a major national record executive said infamously that his label's philosophy was that if his artists were not on country radio, they might as well not exist. I think this is how Chet would have reacted to that statement. Chet and Owen were musically hyper-aware and had incredibly open ears and open minds. They listened widely, appreciating artistry far outside their format. They signed artists with more than short-term commercial success in mind. They thought like musicians, and they put the music first. And they trusted the public to have high expectations and to expect greatness. So here you have Chet, a country kid from East Tennessee, whose world was totally about hillbilly guitar. He comes to Nashville. He absorbs WSM's incredibly deep pop music uh, influences and he becomes a world-class pop music arranger and performer. And here's Owen, raised on big band pop in Middle Tennessee, comes to WSM and absorbs hillbilly music and integrates that into his musical worldview, making some of the greatest country records of all time. So as you pursue your own career and life in music, and especially if somebody tells you that some music is too square or too old-fashioned or not lucrative enough, ask yourself, what would Chet and Owen do? Thank you very much. It's a contact sport, folks. You have to come back. I'm serious. Tom, that, that's why you created this event, right? For stuff like that? I think we just all got... That, that was worth the price of admission right there. Thank you to Craig Havikhurst.